The first Bible verse I learned by heart was John 3, 16. You know it. For God so loved the church and people in church who look like me that God gave. No, that's not the way it goes. It's God so loved the world. Why do we in the church need to keep learning that lesson? Why do we need to be forever reminded that we are not the exclusive recipients of God's love in Christ, that Christ came to save not only us, but all, that the boundaries of the kingdom of God do not end within the confines of this congregation. In Jesus' first sermon in Luke 4, Jesus reminded the congregation of God's expansive mercy towards outsiders in the past. Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. Elisha's healing of Naaman. And I remind you that the congregation hated him for it. To believe that God's love goes beyond the boundaries of the church, beyond the confines of my friends and myself, well, that's disarming. In today's gospel, a powerful man asks Jesus for help. He's not just a prominent person. He's a Roman, a, a Gentile that is non-Jewish. He's an army officer, a centurion in charge of at least a hundred soldiers. Surely one of the most despised people in town because the Romans have their heel on the necks of Judea. And though this man was prominent and powerful, he has also learned his powerlessness when it comes to the most important matters in life. Because his servant, for whom he cares deeply, is ill. Uh, though the man is a master, he knows that he is no master over his beloved servant's illness. So, he sends emissaries to Jesus, asking Jesus to help. Interesting that the man doesn't come to Jesus himself. Jesus might have been impressed to have so powerful a man show up at his door with a full contingent of impressively dressed guard soldiers. Well, the man doesn't come because he feels that he is unworthy. That's amazing. This powerful man doesn't consider himself worthy to go to Jesus. Even when Jesus comes to him, then Centurion sends out people to say, uh, Jesus, don't come to my house. I'm unworthy. Just say the word and heal my servant. That's all I ask. And Jesus turns to the crowd. That is, those who were tagging along behind him. That is, his closest friends. That is, us. And he says to us in amazement, I haven't found faith like this even among us in Israel. And the suffering servant was healed without Jesus even saying the word, be healed. Throughout his ministry, Jesus has been calling forth faith. Believe that the kingdom of God has come near to you. Trust that my way is the way of God. And after all of Jesus' teaching and healing and preaching, Jesus says that he is amazed at having found more faith in the words of this Gentile army officer, this outsider, than among his own followers. It's amazing. But imagine how it must have felt that day to be a disciple, one of the inner circle of Jesus. How did it feel to have sacrificed much, to have left family and friends, to hit the road with Jesus, to share in his trials and tribulations, only to be told by amazed Jesus that this despicable Gentile, whose people had caused so much suffering and oppression among your people, that this Gentile knew more what Jesus was about than you. <laughs> Couldn't have felt good. Maybe the church is the only organization that gathers and celebrates itself, bends itself to its own scriptures, only to thereby constantly be reminded that the church exists not for those of us on the inside, but for those on the outside. The beloved Lord who has come to us, come for us, who gathers us here Today, uh, 
refuses to rest content with us. We invoke the presence of the Holy Spirit during this time of worship. But we know enough about the Holy Spirit to know that the Holy Spirit of Jesus will not be confined to us in our worship, but outflows, overflows effusively into the whole world. And sometimes, let, let's be honest now, it's rather painful to be reminded by Luke or by the words and actions of Jesus that Christ is not content to be Lord of the church, best friends with just us and our friends. Jesus is amazed, not by the perception and obedience of his disciples. He's amazed by the faith of this outsider. Uh, there's a church named Antioch whose season for ministry appeared to be ending. Their membership had dwindled. The few funds they could raise went entirely into their part-time pastor's meager salary or to keeping up their historic building. The only thing they had for ministry now was their building. So Antioch decided to keep their building open 24 hours a day so that anybody on the outside could come inside and pray. Though well, some people did come in off the street and pray. About a dozen people spent most nights sleeping in Antioch Sanctuary. Oh, but their insurance company decreed that they couldn't unlock their building 24 hours a day. The insurance company said that they had to keep those doors locked when they were not having a service of worship. They looked for another insurance company. None would allow them to keep their doors unlocked. So Antioch Church locked their doors. And they put the key to the front door under a rock. And painted on the rock were the words, Key. <laughs> One of the members explained, You know, we haven't had much luck attracting people to our church. Uh, those who are our members are often sporadic in their attendance. Well, the folks who come in our church during the week or stay there at night, they really want to be in church when those of us who are the members of the church don't. They've shamed us into letting them in the church. You know, there are times when Jesus gives us the grace to see faith Faith in the lives and words of outsiders greater than the faith of those of us on the inside. The outsider in the hands of Jesus becomes our teacher. We grow in our faith, not by sitting around and talking to those on the inside, but we're led to faith by those on the outside. I know a church that was notorious for its inner turmoil and conflict. A succession of pastors had come and gone, each pronouncing, this crowd is one of the meanest churches I ever served. Today, that church has been born again. It is now a beacon in the community, an example of church as church ought to be. What happened? Well, a new pastor came and got the church to pay for and to administer a safe home for women and their families who were suffering from domestic violence. That ministry, outside the bounds of that congregation, has transformed that congregation. I asked one of the lay leaders to explain to me their amazing change. You see, we were so focused on our own aches and pains that we needed to get out and find people who were in greater pain than us. We needed to have more to do than sit here and worry about ourselves and our church. We needed to get out with people who weren't in the church in order to be the church. Those women and kids taught us lessons in courage, faith, love, and grit. You understand? <laughs> On the basis of Luke 7, sitting at the feet of a centurion, I think I do understand. Now, I'll admit that most of this sermon has been an insider 
talking to a bunch of insiders. This has been a time for those of us insiders, and hey, you must really be a faithful insider to be in church on this beautiful Sunday, to receive revelation from an outsider. But is there anybody here this morning who can empathize, relate to this outsider? Is there somebody here who maybe feels out of place? Are you sitting there knowing something about Jesus that has attracted you here, but not knowing as much of those who have been here for years? Uh, do you feel unworthy to be here with Jesus and his very best friends? Well, if you're that person, welcome. We need you. We need your questions, your different perspective on things. We need your faith. Your faith that all Jesus has to do is just speak the word and your life will be healed. Your presence here is proof to us that Jesus is still busy reclaiming the world. Today's gospel implies that in your healing, we shall also be healed, remade into the followers Jesus deserves.